Good evening, everyone. My name is Lyle Mook. I teach biblical thought in the philosophy department here at URI and uh, pastor Christ Church in East Greenwich. Welcome to the Veritas Forum. Now, the Veritas Forum at URI is sponsored by University Christian Fellowship, uh, by Refresh Student Ministry, and also we have co-sponsors in our community of uh, the Bridge Church, West Kingston Baptist Church, Christ Church, and the Evangelical Ministers Fellowship. We would love to have your help uh, as we proceed with Veritas Forums. During the first few minutes uh, of the presentation tonight, there'll be uh, some sheets, some clipboards go by that will allow you to sign up for a brief online survey. Uh, you will not be uh, put in any kind of mail lists, and for an incentive, they're actually going to put you into a, uh, a running for an iPad 2, which probably will be obsolete by the time you get it, but nevertheless. <laughs> You will also have uh, note cards available that you should have uh, near your seat or handed to you. Uh, these are available for you to write down questions during the lecture. Uh, and so we'll have a Q&A time afterwards uh, that we'll take from questions from uh, the audience as well as questions that you have written out already during uh, the talk. To introduce our speaker tonight, it's my great privilege uh, to welcome the president of the University of Rhode Island, Dr. David Dooley. Thanks, Lyle. It's, a, it's election time again in the United States, so once again, higher education finds itself uh, uh, in the news in ways that are frequently not terribly uh, complimentary and, and all too often revolve around the proposition that in many people's opinion, America's colleges and universities have become nothing more than fora for indoctrination. Now, I have been on college campuses of one sort or of another, and this is embarrassing to admit, since 1970, when as an 18-year-old, I walked onto the campus of the University of California at San Diego. I went on from there to the California Institute of Technology, and from there to Amherst College. And while at Amherst College, I spent time at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford University, and many others. I have never found America's colleges and universities to be factories of indoctrination. I have found them to be, rather when they work, to be centers of discovery and exploration. And that is really what the University of Rhode Island strives principally to be for its students, a place where you can come and explore as I did, discover who you are as I did, and to figure out your place in life and what your ambitions and dreams and aspirations might truly be. And we're glad to partner with the Veritas Forum in this regard because I think it is now an organization that encourages communities like the community at the University of Rhode Island to come together and to explore some of the most difficult and challenging questions that humanity has ever faced and still, in many respects, has not answered, but in which the quest for those answers are perhaps uh, more urgent than ever. And that's why I wanted to be here tonight to share with you, because I think this is an important event for all of us to come together. I'm convinced, and many of you may have heard me say, that in the 21st century, in a global society, in a global economy, finding ways to build relationships and discover common ground with people who are very different than you are has never been more important. And that means we must come together and find ways to engage one another's ideas when our worldviews are incompatible or inconsistent or at least different, to find ways to work together, build constructive relationships, and find ways to explore those difficult and challenging questions together. And I think opportunities like that presented by the Veritas Forum are an important opportunity for us to do that. So thank you for joining us uh, this evening and engaging, I think, in that discussion. We'll come at it tonight, or the speaker will come at it tonight, from a particular point of view, a very theistic and explicitly Christian point of view that may not be shared by everybody here, but is one which represents an awful lot of people on this campus. And you will find on the University of Rhode Island campus people 
espousing all kinds of views about these matters, and that's what makes tonight especially important. Our speaker tonight received his bachelor's degree in chemistry and mathematics from Rice University in Houston and his PhD in chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley, a minor competitor of the California Institute of Technology, I might add. <laughs> Following a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, he joined the faculty at MIT where he is now an associate professor of chemistry. His research focuses on the intersection of quantum mechanics and chemistry, and in particular, his work addresses questions of how solar energy can be efficiently captured, stored, and utilized for catalysis. He is the author of nearly 45 scientific, or probably over 45 scientific publications now, and is a fellow of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Now, I realize I may be alone tonight in the following statement. I'm very much looking forward to Professor Van Voorhis' talk tonight on science and faith, on why science isn't enough. I'm really looking forward to your talk. But I might be the only one who would be just as excited to hear you talk either about direct coupling, O2 bond formation, and cobalt oxide water oxidation catalysis, or in triplet excitation energy transfer with constrained, in constrained density functional theory. But we can leave that to another time, Troy. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Troy Van Voorhis of MIT. Yes, there we go. This would have been a very different talk if I didn't have my notes. Well, thank you, Professor. Thank you, President Dooley. Uh, I have to say I forgive you for uh, going to Caltech. Uh, Caltech exists because not everyone can get into MIT. <laughs> no, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, and I also do want to really thank you guys because I understand it. Uh, you guys have all made a critical decision by being here at my talk today. Uh, because as I understand it, there's a competing event on URI's campus that's going on right as we speak over in Edwards Auditorium. Uh, the Miss URI pageant is going on. Uh, and so I thank you that you chose this talk over the Miss URI pageant. I'm sure that that was a real uh, nail biter for many of you. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between science and faith. Uh, and in my, if you ask me, the popular conception of these things is that science and faith uh, live in opposition to each other. Uh, that is to say that there's some kind of an ideological war going on between the two. And so when people find out that I'm a scientist and also a Christian, uh, I typically get quizzical looks and questions like, well, doesn't that cause a lot of problems for you? Uh, to which my typical answer is, well, no, not really. And when I dig a little bit deeper, I usually find that in most cases, these questions arrive out, arise out of misperceptions. Misconceptions on the one hand of what science does and does not offer us, uh, and misconceptions on the other hand of what faith requires of me as a believer. And so I think before I get to the question of integration of science and faith, I think it's worth us taking some time to unpack those issues, to discuss those misperceptions, so that they don't color our discussion later on. Okay, so to start off, I'm just going to talk about some of the misperceptions that I've encountered about science. Uh, and I'll, I've got three myths that I want to try to dispel, uh, and so I'll take them in turn. So the first myth that I run into a lot is the idea that to be a good scientist, you need to be an atheist. Uh, this point seems to be coming up with increasing frequency of late, uh, and so I think it's important for us to discuss it at the outset. Uh, one of the main champions, or the main group of champions of an argument like this are folks like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett, the so-called uh, new atheists, or as I like to call them, the evangelical atheists. Uh, they, they really promote the idea that, um, that to be a scientist, you have to be an atheist. And now, like all the misperceptions we're going to talk about tonight, there is a kernel of truth in this statement. And that kernel of truth is this, in science, uh, to do good science, you're required to be an objective observer. Uh, if I do an experiment and I collect the data and then I analyze it in a biased way, for example, by throwing out the data points that don't agree with the conclusion I want to draw, the result is not just bad science, it is not science. Uh, so, for example, if I was to run a chemical reaction and find at the end of the reaction that I got 125% yield, well, one possible reaction I might have to that would be, yes! <laughs> God suspended the laws of conservation of the mass in the middle of organic chemistry lab just for me. I deserve an A++ on this lab report. 
And that would not be science, because I would be discarding the more plausible explanation, namely that I had mismeasured the starting materials for the reaction at the beginning, in favor of a less plausible explanation. Uh, and the um, doing science requires me to not do that. It requires me to report and analyze my data in an objective, unbiased way. And so from there, the argument goes that, well, not believing in God is clearly less biased than believing in God. Therefore, to be a scientist, you must become an atheist, QED. But there's a flaw in this argument, and the flaw is that, not, that atheism is every bit as biased a position as theism. Science can no more prove the non-existence of God than science can prove the existence of God. Uh, and so this is something of a solution, but it's also something of a non-solution because it means we are stuck. On the one hand, we have theism. On the other hand, we have atheism, and both positions are biased. Uh, but this really shouldn't shock us uh, because scientists are biased in any number of ways. Uh, we're biased in spiritual, emotional, intellectual ways, and we bring all of this baggage into the lab with us. And the secret to being a good scientist, in my experience, isn't that you need to become some kind of unfeeling, skeptical robot who just runs experiments. The secret to being a good scientist is to be able to take your biases and set them aside for a time while you do experiments so that you can analyze your data in a rational and unbiased way. And so, in that context, being an atheist provides no particular advantage to doing good science. Uh, it's just another bias that you have to set aside when you're doing an experiment. So that's the first misconception I want to set aside, the idea that science requires atheism. The second misconception that I run into a lot uh, is the idea that science, uh, by the work that it is doing, science is making God irrelevant. Uh, and here, uh, the argument goes something like this. Uh, in ancient times, people needed God. They needed him to, to explain all kinds of things that they didn't understand, like lightning and disease and drought. But nowadays, science explains to us how all of these things happen in terms of chemistry and biology and physics. And so as time goes on, we find that we need God less and less, and eventually we won't need him at all. So this is the point of view that is often known as the God of the gaps approach, and it's uh, fundamentally incorrect. The key fallacy at work here is the idea that God can only exist in phenomena that science cannot explain. Uh, that the expansion of scientific knowledge necessarily means that we're squeezing God into smaller and smaller boxes. But this is the incorrect picture of God because the reality is that God is not the God of the gaps. God is the God of everything. He's the God of the whole enchilada. And so the truth is that as science gets bigger, as we discover new things, God gets bigger. Or at the very least, our understanding of God gets bigger. As the Apostle Paul said, The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. That is to say, he doesn't live in the little boxes we leave over for him. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is actually not far from each one of us. The fact that I can look at the North Star and tell you that that is an astronomical body that exists 434 light years away from the Earth does not for me diminish the majesty of the creator of that star, the one who ordained its path. Instead, it adds to my awe and wonder. So that's the second myth, the idea that somehow science is making or is going to make faith irrelevant. The third thing that I want to discuss is the idea that science is the only path to certainty. So on some level, it is natural to think this. It's natural to think that scientific inquiry is the only way to really be sure about something. After all, science is based on evidence, things that we can measure and see, and as they say, seeing is believing. And so it's in this particular aspect, the, the idea of science, science being the path to certainty, by the contrast of that argument, you would say, people would say that, well, faith then is really not a path to certainty. Instead, it's some kind of flimsy guesswork, something that can't really lead to certainty at all. So let me explain why I think this is incorrect. Because, of course, scientific evidence can increase our confidence in a proposition. But confidence is not the same as certainty. 
So as the sort of humorous saying goes, you can tell a chap that there are 300 sextillion stars in the universe, and he will believe you. But you tell that same person that a chair is covered in wet paint, and he'll need to touch it to be sure. <laughs> because he is confident, but he's not certain. And the, the reality is that it's only in mathematics, which was my other undergraduate degree, it's only in mathematics that facts and logic are enough to produce certainty. In the physical world, it's never, or at least rarely, quite that simple. In most situations, there is evidence that supports a given conclusion and evidence that contradicts it. Uh, as Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner in physics, once said, in science, we have found it of paramount importance that in order to make progress, we must rec recognize our ignorance and leave room for doubt. Scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, none absolutely certain. Because even for a theory with no known exceptions, you know, that there's, there's not a single shred of evidence that this theory could be wrong, scientists must always be wary because there's always the chance that when more data comes in, the theory could turn out to be wrong. And classical mechanics will give way to quantum mechanics, or Newton will be replaced by Einstein. Because the reality is that historically speaking, science has contributed greatly to the increase of human knowledge, but has not contributed significantly at all to human certainty. And to me, this is a very fundamental point for a forum like Veritas, where what we're really looking for is truth. Because if something is true, I want to be certain. There can't be any statements like, oh, well, by all means, that's true, well, except for if it isn't true. Because truth without certainty is not truth, or at least it's not truth that's worth very much. And so if we're saying we're seeking truth, we really do want certainty. And so it's important to recognize that this sort of popular idea of science is the way to certainty isn't really quite right. OK, so those were my, the misperceptions I wanted to dispel about science. Now I want to talk about some of the misperceptions on the other side, things people have told me they think about faith that I think are, are off the mark. So again, I have three, three myths I want to dispel. The first one is the idea that having faith means that you have to believe in fill in the blank with your favorite controversial topic. You have to believe in evolution, the Big Bang. You can't believe in dinosaur. You can't believe in evolution or the Big Bang or dinosaurs. And this is a big fear that a lot of people have. And so I feel like we should get it on the table first because there is a general fear that in that. Being a, becoming a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew requires not only accepting God, but also a whole host of other propositions that run counter to scientific evidence. Now again, there is a kernel of truth here. And that kernel of truth is that historically speaking, there are any number of questions where the church and science have been at odds. The age of the earth, the origin of species, whether the earth revolves around the sun or the sun revolves around the earth. Now, in Christianity, most of the arguments with science are based on biblical scriptures. And as a Christian, I believe that the Bible is true. I believe that it is without error. And the Bible does contain a great deal of evidence about God's action in the natural world. However, just as scientific evidence requires interpretation to have meaning, so too scriptural evidence and church teaching also require interpretation. Let me give you an illustration of this uh, point. So let's consider the issue of spontaneous generation. This is the idea that life can spontaneously form from inanimate objects. Okay, this sounds like kind of a crazy idea, doesn't it? Um, but the key, the key example of this would be to take a bowl of cornmeal and leave it out. And sure enough, if you leave it out long enough, maggots will grow in the bowl of cornmeal. They'll spontaneously grow in the cornmeal. And the, and the predominant scientific viewpoint of this observation for about 2,000 years was that the reason that happens is because air and cornmeal come together spontaneously to make maggots. Okay, I know this is a really great and appealing image, but just stick with me on it. It, it gets better. So that was the scientific viewpoint for about 2,000 years. Now, meanwhile, on the side of Christianity, early Christian scholars looked at the Bible, and they saw passages like the Israelites discovering quail in the desert, or Samson discovering a beehive in the carcass of a lion. And they said, aha, look, scripture agrees with the scientific theory. Spontaneous generation is right. And so for 2,000 years, everybody was happy because everyone agreed. 
And then in the late 19th century, Louis Pasteur came along and showed that in fact spontaneous generation was not the normal course of things. And we all agree with this now. But the conclusion to this is not that the original scientific experiments were wrong or that the scripture is wrong because they were not wrong per se. The scientific evidence was correct. Maggots really do grow in bowls of cornmeal. It wasn't falsified, it's true. And as Christians, we still believe that the, is that the Israelites did find quail in the desert. The thing that was wrong was the interpretation of that evidence. It's not the normal course of events that life springs from non-life. When that happens, something unusual or even miraculous has occurred. And so that illustrates when I say scripture requires interpretation, sometimes that makes people get really upset. I just wanted to point out what I mean when I say scripture requires interpretation. Scripture requires interpretation in the same way that scientific facts require interpretation. Why is this important? Well, because as a Christian, I believe that God gave us the scriptures. He also gave us the ability to reason and the opportunity to pray for him for guidance. And I believe that by the judicious application of these tools, we can arrive at the truth. And so I understand that people think that me being a Christian means I accepted without question some universal doctrine of how science and the scriptures uh, fit together. But the reality is that my walk as a Christian is much more one of using scripture and prayer and, yes, reason to try to seek the truth. So that was the first myth that I wanted to sort of dispel there, the idea that believing in God means that you also have to believe in, fill in the blank with your controversial topic. The second myth that I often get a lot about faith is the idea that faith is just a form of non-thinking. Um, so this is, uh, the idea here is that faith means believing in things in spite of un incontrovertible evidence to the contrary. That is, faith is the magic of believing things that are false. Uh, put it in another way, uh, this is the characterization that says that people of faith are the same people that, that will staunchly assert that the Apollo moon landing was fake but professional wrestling is real. <laughs> that faith is the kind of thing that when confronted with contrary evidence is the attitude that you just stick your ears, fingers in your ears and say, na, 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 I can't hear that. So this is a criticism of blind faith. And we very often encounter people who have this kind of faith. I have one particular story I like to share on this. I have a colleague who is an expert in electromagnetic radiation and how it can be used for imaging of objects. Uh, and around the time that the US government was commissioning the first stealth bombers, he was invited down to the Army Research Lab in order to give a talk on his research. And at the end of his presentation, he added a couple of slides to his talk to just tell the, the Army or the, the Air Force a little bit about the fact that he had an idea that perhaps using terahertz waves, you could actually design a device that might be able to see something like a stealth bomber. He thought the Air Force might be interested to know this fact. And so he gave his talk and he sat down at the, and at the end of his talk, a three-star general in the Air Force stood up and said, son, you are mistaken. That plane is invisible. And my colleague backpedaled a bit and said, well, Yes, I mean, well, no one has actually built a detection device like this, so in principle, it's probably safe. And I was just trying to make the point, and the general said, no. And in a very ominous tone said, I said that plane is invisible. Now, my colleague was a very smart man. And he realized that if he continued in this line of reasoning, he was very likely to wake up the next day with a very bad headache. And so he very quickly said, oh, did you say invisible? My mistake. Yes, sir, absolutely invisible. See, that's an example of blind faith, faith that was literally blind. The belief in invisible planes is pretty blind. And it's a faith that has, it's a position, defending, it's a position that you're trying to defend that has no evidence and no justification other than perhaps some implied threats. And in Christianity, this is not the kind of faith that God requires or even desires of us. As Thomas Burton once said, faith is a decision, a judgment that is fully and deliberately taken in the light of a truth that cannot be proven. It is not merely the acceptance of a decision that has been made by someone else. 
because evidence and reason are important components of the Christian faith. Christians believe God left evidence of his action here on earth, and he expects us to examine that evidence. In fact, much of the Bible was written for precisely this purpose. Thus, the writer of the Gospel of Luke introduces his gospel by saying, It seemed good to me, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, that you might be certain of the things you have been taught. There is all manner of historical evidence for the Christian faith. The empty tomb, the perseverance of early Christians, the consistency of their testimony. The evidence is not incontrovertible, but it is there if you want to look for it. So that was the second point that I wanted to dispel, the idea that faith is just this blind form of non-thinking. Finally, uh, I want to uh, talk about one other myth that people hold out about faith, and that is the idea that faith is an escape. Uh, So here, this criticism is primarily tied to the claim of life after death that exists in Christianity and also most other major religions. Uh, The existence of an eternal home with no sickness or sorrow or pain led Sigmund Freud to to claim that religious belief belief was just a kind of wish fulfillment. Meanwhile, on the other side, at about the same time, the French existentialists were saying that people were only religious because they were afraid of the alternative. The alternative being that after we die, there's just an eternity of nothingness. Now, neither of these characterizations of Christianity hold up to thoughtful examination, so let's consider both of the arguments separately. First, as to fear of the alternative. Well, who wouldn't fear the alternative? I mean, fearing an eternity of nothingness just proves that I'm rational, doesn't prove that I'm trying to escape from anything. The idea, to me, seems to be that for an upper upper class, upper middle class academic like myself, that it's somehow courageous for me to stand in front of you in my nice tweed jacket and say, clearly this is all we can, all there is. There is nothing beyond what we can see. Death is the end. Now please pass me my grande latte. Because to me, there is something disingenuous about a comfortable atheism that is not afraid of death. I think there's, you know, there's not no two ways about that. As to the other argument, the idea that faith in eternal life amounts to wish fulfillment. Well, if one were trying to formulate a religion based on wish fulfillment, why include all the inconvenient injunctions about helping the poor or caring for the sick or trying to look for justice for the oppressed? Why include the possibility of damnation? Why not just found a religion based on eating chocolate all day? The reason is because the Christian faith is not a means to escape the material world, but a means to engage it. As a Christian, I don't believe in God because I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven because I believe in God. Because I know what God is like, and I want to be near him. It's a journey, not an escape. So those are, for me, uh, the main misconceptions about faith. And faith, and for these reasons and a host of others, I think the popular caricature caricature of science and faith uh, as being mutually exclusive is just that. It's a caricature. Uh, And so we're left with the question of whether and how science and faith can be integrated uh, productively. And to this end, it's important to realize that science and faith are not disjoint. They are not, as Stephen Jay Gould called them, non-overlapping magisteria. There is, in fact, tension between the claims of science and the claims of faith. Um, If they made completely unrelated truth claims, I wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be all these arguments about, well, which one is right and where should we go? Um, Thus, tonight, I would like us to consider not just whether science and faith can come to a ceasefire, but whether or not there might be some productive alliance between the two, a means by which science enriches faith, while faith gives science greater meaning. Now, to start off, I think it is manifestly true that the natural world informs our understanding of God. Um, As the psalmist wrote, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Or, as Isaac Newton said, It is the perfection of God's works that they are all done with the greatest simplicity. He is the God of order and not of confusion. 
There is an unbroken chain of witnesses stretching from ancient to modern times echoing how much scientific observation can inform our understanding of God. But what about the other side of things? Are there ways that Christian faith can inform our scientific thinking? And as a Christian and a scientist, I see at least one fundamental way in which faith is useful, and I would argue even necessary, to find ultimate truth with the tools of science. The problem, as I see it, is that science can never lead to any kind of truth that changes me. See, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the basis for scientific inquiry is the idea of objective truth, the idea that truth is an object that exists completely independent of the subject, namely me. Thus, science divorces the truth from the truth seeker. Uh, another way to put it uh, is uh, that in one of the most wonderful passages of Scripture, one of my favorites, Jesus taught his disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. By contrast, the promise of modern science is the somewhat more mundane, you shall know the truth, but we cannot guarantee that the truth will have any meaningful impact on your life. Uh, because I am here and the truth is out there. And this is a challenge that all of academia faces. So let me give you an example of what I really mean by this. Suppose you took an ethics class that focused on moral rationalism, the idea that moral principles can be deduced based on the tools of reason alone. And you spend the semester reading Plato and Kant and Richard Hare. And in class discussion, you, you demonstrate how truths like it is wrong to lie and it is unjust not to share with those who are in need. You demonstrate by rational reasoning that those are true statements. All right. So now, in that course, you have a final examination. And I want you to consider two possible final examinations. The first is one that consists of one question, and that question is this. Uh, it says... Write an essay that uses moral rationalism to defend the statement, truth-telling is always right. So you've got to write an essay about that. I, I am pretty sure that most of us have taken an exam like that at some point in our lives. Now consider an alternative exam also consisting of one question. The question is this. In class, we use moral rationalism to show that lying and not sharing with those in need are wrong. How many times during this semester have you lied or failed to share what you have with those in need? Grading will be as follows, minus one point for every lie, minus five points for every failure to share, and minus 100 points for lying in response to this question. <laughs> you see, we laugh at that because we don't expect what we learn in the classroom to actually change the way we behave at all. And to my mind, this is a fundamental problem with the scientific worldview. It possesses no power to transform people. And this is the place where faith becomes crucial in science, turning it from a cold, dead exercise into something that is vibrant and life-giving. In order to see why we need faith to accomplish this transformation, I want to hearken back and, and remind you that it is our convictions, the things that we are absolutely certain of, that govern our behavior. If I am going to organize my life about an ideal or principle, I want to be absolutely sure that that principle is right. If I am uncertain, I will be inclined to wait for more evidence to come in before I make my decision and before I act. But this doesn't work because from a scientific perspective, there's always more evidence to wait for. And so we never make a decision and we never act. Scientific evidence can give us greater and greater and greater confidence, but it never gets us all the way across the gap from indecision to certainty. That last step is always the step of faith. Now, this need not be religious faith. You could have faith in the goodness of humanity, faith in other people, or even faith in the law of gravity, but making decisions requires a leap of faith because faith is the thing that gives us a framework for making decisions in the light of evidence. Let me give you an example. Suppose I feel there is convincing scientific evidence that human activity is contributing to global warming. Now, I just want to pause there and note that I said at the beginning, suppose, this is a hypothetical, I'm not trying to make any case about whether humans are or are not making global warming worse. But suppose I am convinced by the scientific evidence. 
But even though I'm convinced I still drive an SUV, I still leave incandescent light bulbs on at home when I'm not there, I crank the air conditioning in the summer, I fly tens of thousands of miles every year on vacation. In this situation, I would contend that I, while I may be convinced, I am not certain. Because if I was certain, I would change my behavior. Um, because the fact that I persist in activity that produces large amounts of CO2 proves one of two things. It proves either that I don't think what I am doing actually contributes to global warming, or it proves that I am a fundamentally evil person who doesn't care about the future of the planet or the security of the country or the well-being of my children. And I hope that you will give me the benefit of the doubt and assume that the answer is not B. Okay, let me give you another example from the side of religion. As a Christian, I believe that prayer is extremely important. Uh, the Bible teaches me that uh, God listens to prayer, that I have direct access to God, and that he answers prayer. The Bible even instructs me to pray continually. And I am convinced that these things are true. And yet, when I wake up early in the morning and my kids are still asleep and I go downstairs, I have the choice to either spend that time in prayer or use that time to answer email. And sure, sometimes I choose to pray, but sometimes I choose to answer email. And the reason for that is because I am not always certain, deep down in the core of my being, that the prayer I offer in the morning is going to matter. Whereas I am certain that if I answer all of these emails, I won't have to answer them again. Now, I share that example so that you can know that I am not perfect. And I know, I know, this is coming as a shock to many of you, because up to now, you probably all thought I was perfect. But unfortunately, I am not. Uh, and as far as I know, neither are any of my scientific or religious colleagues. Uh, and to my mind, this is the primary argument in favor of Christianity over and above any other religious worldview. And that is the fact that Christianity gives us not only a framework for deciding how we should behave, it also gives us the means to act according to those decisions. And the means is the person of Jesus Christ. As a Christian, I believe that when we place our faith in Christ, then the person of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, comes to live in us, and you and me. And fundamentally, what I believe in is Jesus' ability to change me, to change who I am, and to make my life different. Let me explain to you um, why this is so important to me. So in junior high and high school, I was a geek. Now, I know, again, this is coming as a shock to you. You think, <laughs> MIT professor of quantum chemistry, you were a geek in high school. Get out of town. I would have never guessed that. But in fact, it's shocking but true. Um, I was a geek. I was too smart for my own good. I was socially awkward. I was unathletic. And I, plus, I mean, I'm tall now, which means when I was in high school, I grew very quickly, which meant six, year, six months out of the year, you could count on it that my clothes would be two sizes too small for me. And you know, the unfortunate reality is that chicks don't dig tall, scrawny, awkward <laughs> dudes who don't know how to dress themselves. And so in the social structure of my high school, there were the cool kids and then there were the kids like me. And I was one of those unpopular kids who desperately wanted to be cool. And it didn't make me all that nice of a person. You know, I would shun people who I perceived to be lower on the social ladder than I was. You know, the other people who also didn't have the money to buy all the right clothes, or all the other members of my chemistry Olympiad team, who in my opinion were far, far nerdier than I was. And life out of high school didn't really turn out all that different for me. I just found myself substituting for, uh, something else for popularity, some other out of a host of ultimate goals, things like good grades, success in my career, wealth, fame, because the problem isn't with high school. It isn't with the in crowd or with college or academia. The problem is with me, the things that I want. And no matter how hard I work, I can't change that problem because I am the problem. And theistic naturalism doesn't provide any help here. You know, if God just set the universe in motion and then hung up a sign that says, be back in 25 billion years, then I'm out of luck. Whatever I am is whatever I am. 
And in fact, it's sad to say, but most religions are actually even worse on this issue than theistic naturalism. Because they tie our acceptance to God based on our ability to accomplish a certain set of tasks, or to live by a certain creed or, or, or set of rules. Only in Christianity does God provide the means to change who we are. The same God who set the universe in motion, who gives life and breath to every living thing, that same God sent to us the means of our redemption in Jesus Christ. And in Christianity, it's only in Christianity that God takes our ability to reason and our capacity for love and our profound tendency to fail, wraps it all together and turns it into something beautiful. And for me, that theistic Christian worldview provides the most satisfying context in which to interpret science. And so I think we have much to discuss, uh, much to talk about, because so much of what we do with evidence depends on how we interpret it. And so I'm looking forward to the question and answer session, but before we get to that, I have one final anecdote to share that just illustrates how important interpretations can be. And the anecdote is this. So a father and a son went camping in the mountains. And when night fell, they made camp and went to sleep. And sometime during the night, the father awoke and rolled over and saw his son staring up at the heavens. And the father said, are you looking at the stars, son? And the son looking up said, uh-huh. Dad, what does that tell you? And the dad thought for a minute and said, well, son, when I look up there, I see billions and billions of stars all obeying the universal law of gravitation. The son was not impressed with this. He just simply looked up and said, uh-huh. So the father tried again. He said, ah, what I see when I look up at that constellation, by looking at its inclination with respect to the horizon, I can tell that the stars say it is about 3.30 in the morning. Uh-huh. Son was still not impressed. Looking up at the sky, said, well, so the father tried one last time, and he said, looking up at the beauty of the heavens, I see that the Lord Almighty has ordered the course of every single stars, star in the sky, and has so ordered the entire law of the universe so as it, to sustain life. In short, he created the whole universe so that you and I could enjoy it. Pretty good, huh? Son was still not impressed. He said, Dad, you know what it tells me? What, son? It tells me somebody stole our tent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We uh, have quite a few minutes, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, for some uh, Q&A. And uh, if you have questions that you wrote down on cards, uh, please uh, pass them over. I guess you know, there's ushers uh, here that will grab those cards. And uh, we'll also take some, some questions from the audience. Um, let me use my, my prerogative to start off with the first, first question. I had, had the joy of having uh, dinner with Troy, and one of the things he said that he didn't elaborate on, I, I thought was, was really, uh, really pretty cool. So I'm going to ask you. <laughs> you mentioned how uh, it's not just the compatibility of faith and science that jazzes you, but that your actual scientific work is, is very thrilling and energizing to mm -hmm. you, a la, you know, what was the, you know, use the movie example. Yeah, of, yeah. Uh, so the, yeah, so the movie example that I gave, there's, this, the, there's the quote from Chariots of Fire where um, Eric Liddell says, you know, tell, tells his fiance that, you know, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Um, and I definitely do feel some of that uh, when, when I am doing my work as a scientist. I feel that God made me to do something and that this is part of what God made me to do. Now, that's not to say that I always know exactly where I'm going, but, um, but I do... I do find that, I mean, I've, I often share this when I talk to students and graduate students, and I say, you know, we have the great luxury of being able to choose what we want to do. I mean, I'm sure for some of the college students out there, it seems like a great curse. Like, what am I going to do with my life? But it's a luxury. You know, for 1,500 years, people didn't have a choice about what they were going to do. It's just, what am I going to do? Well, what did my parents do? That's what I'm going to do. Um, so we have the luxury to be able to choose what we do. 
And so if I'm going to be able to choose what I do, I better choose something that lets me get closer to God. Because otherwise, I'm spending 40 or 50 hours a week just wasting my time, putting off the process of actually drawing close to God. Um, and so for me, the process of, say, solving a mathematical equation or writing a good paper or clearly explaining something to a student, when I do these things, I definitely feel God's hand working through me um, when I'm you know, in a good place, in, in, you know, when I, those mornings when I remember to go downstairs and pray instead of answer email. Um, and so I think that is an important thing to think about science, which is to say, you know, you know, for those of us who are believers in science, you know, to think about how what we are doing in science really pleases or does not please God. Um, it's, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Question? Anyone have a question you'd like to ask? So that's a that's a good question. So you know, you want to hear that question? I can I can repeat it. So he he was asking he was he was making the comparison between scientific advancement and the Tower of Babel, uh, the end, and the story of the Tower of Babel. For those who may not be familiar with it, it's a story of uh, people who decided that they were going to make themselves like God. They were going to build a tower that reached all the way up to heaven, all the way up to where God's throne was. Um, and as they were building it, God decided, no, that's not a good thing for you to do. And so he struck down the, the tower um, and scattered all of the people who were making it. And his question was, do I see some sense in which science is like the building of the Tower of Babel? And if so, do I see some consequences for science uh, based on the sort of moral of that story? And I, I'll give two pieces to that. So the first thing I want to say is that, well, yes, there are some similarities between science and the Tower of Babel. Um, but the similarities are only, uh, the similarities, in order, before I tell you what those similarities are, I want to point out that for the Tower of Babel, it wasn't as if God was saying, don't build tall towers. It wasn't the, the physical act of building the tower that was displeasing to God. It was the attitude of the people who were building it. Their attitude was that by building this tower, we will become just as good as God, and we won't need him anymore. Um, and so what he was striking down in that story was that attitude, the attitude of pride in the people who were building the tower, that they were independent and they were just going to do it all themselves. And so when I say that science is like the Tower of Babel, it is like the Tower of Babel in both ways, in that, you know, as a rule, I would say that scientists are very proud. Uh, you know, if, if you haven't ever met an arrogant scientist, you probably haven't met very many scientists. Um, and, you know, I think there is a sense in which scientists do take this prideful attitude of that we are building this empire of science that's completely independent from God. And then eventually we're just going to strike down religion. You won't need it anymore. And I think that that is false. Um, you know, and whether God decides to strike that down or not, I think it's something that we, that, that we should not adhere to. Um, the idea that somehow you know, this sort of arrogant sort of science is king of all things viewpoint. But on the flip side, I don't think that that means that God is ever going to shut off science and say, oh, well, now scientific discovery just stops because, because of these arrogant scientists. Um, what he's going to stop is the pride. He's not necessarily going to stop the things that people are attaching pride to. Um, does that answer the question? Would it be fair to say that God will never feel threatened by good science? I think that's a pretty safe assumption, yes. <laughs> Here's a question. Uh, what do you do when a scientific theory, like the ideas that Freud put forth in psychology about religion when those theories directly contradict a proposition of faith? Yeah, so th that's an interesting question. So in the particular example of Freud's theories of psychology, um, you know, again, this gets back to the point of interpretation. I think that you do need to consider, when there is new scientific evidence, as believers, we do need to consider this. We need to say, look, let's really examine this evidence and figure out what's really going on here. I mean, so the example of Freud is probably not the, the best one, because in my opinion, not even many psychologists agree with Freud very much anymore, much less Christians. So, um, so it's fairly easy to say, oh, well, you know, I don't mind about Freud. 
Um, but you know, there certainly are going to be instances where, as a scientist, I'm going to be exposed to lots of evidence, and sometimes that evidence is going to con contradict some belief that I hold on faith. And it is my responsibility to re-examine the faith that I have. Um, and I think in that sense, it's important to point out that a lot of people think that faith means never doubting. Uh, and that is, in fact, not true. Uh, we can doubt points that we hold on faith all the time as Christians. Uh, in fact, you know, we're expected to doubt. The only thing that I don't doubt as a, as a Christian is the author of those facts. So I don't doubt God. Sometimes I say, well, gee, could I have possibly gotten this wrong? I mean, I know God didn't get it wrong, but maybe I could have. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's healthy for us to actually consider those kinds of things. And it will ultimately lead, because ultimately what we find, want to find is the truth. And ignoring some scientific evidence isn't going to get us closer to the truth. That is, yes, that is absolutely true. On both sides, it should be open to interpretation. And I think part of the difficulty in the discussion of science and faith is that sometimes people of faith are all too eager to question the scientific data, and the scientists are all too eager to, to question the scriptural data, but no one is self-questioning. You know, I'm not being self-analytical of saying, well, let me really re-examine my position. I'm only trying to knock down the other guy. Um, so I don't think that, so I think your point is, is correct, that we need to be in analytical on both sides. Picking up on um, something you said in your talk, Troy, if scripture, prayer, and reason should lead us to the right interpretation of truth, why did Christians believe in spontaneous generation for hundreds of years? Yeah, so, um, so I, I guess that's one of those times where you, know, you can't see what I wrote. So I, when I wrote that, that sentence, there, in that sentence, there was a capital T on truth because in, in scripture, the, the use of the word truth is, is actually as a sort of a metonym for Jesus. Um, so in, in, ultimate, in the ultimate reality of, the, of my interpretation of the Bible, the ultimate highest truth in the Bible is revealed in Jesus Christ um, as the form of truth. And so ultimately, one of the reasons that we, in, we look at Scripture so much is to get closer to and understand better the truth that he has revealed. Um, now, as to the point of fact about um, you know, spontaneous generation, you know, the... The, you know, as to why is it that, well, by prayer and reason and scripture, we didn't immediately see that spontaneous generation wasn't right. Well, you know, I mean, I think that does point out the, the thing that I said before, which is none of us is perfect. Uh, so that, you know, and this isn't some postmodern statement of, you know, all truths are equal, none of us are. We, I believe that there is a universal truth and that we are seeking towards it, but I don't believe that we've gotten there. Um, I don't think that any of us would claim to know, oh, yes, I have every single scriptural point. I know everything right about every single thing that God would have to say. Or if they did, I would severely mistrust their... Okay. It's an interesting, yeah, an interesting historical question as to, you know, if, if the sort of prevailing biological point would be different if, you know, they had published in the opposite order if Gregor Mendel had not been an introvert and Charles Darwin a huge extrovert. Um. Well, whoever wrote this might be able, may, may have to help me out. I think I understand the question. But as a scientist, when a group of people aggressively claim something to be inexplicable, and the same group infers that it is an act of God, are you inclined 
to pursue reason or rationale regardless of this claim or would you accept it as is? Okay, would I be inclined to, okay. No, I think I understand. So, so, okay, so first of all, let me give my interpretation about, so, so this is basically, I think, a question about miracles, if, if I understand correctly. If, I'm, if, if whoever asked the question thinks I'm leading astray, then please say, no, no, I was asking about something different. But saying that if there is something that is inexplicable according to the natural laws, attributing that to an act of God, that sort of is my definition of something that's miraculous. Um, and so the question then is, well, if somebody says this is a miracle, am I inclined to take that on face value and say, okay, well, it's a miracle, or am I inclined to um, look, out, look for a rational explanation? And here I want to clarify something that's very important about miracles and that I think is commonly misunderstood by scientists, and that is the idea that a miracle means something for which there is, there is no possible scientific explanation at all. It's completely scientifically impossible. Uh, and that is, and, and that therefore, if you can come up with some scientific explanation, that it was therefore not a miracle. Uh, that is, in fact, not the case, um, because it, it's based on a fallacy of saying that there can only be one possible explanation for an event. Um, you know, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, this, you know, why is the water boiling? Well, there's two explanations for that. One is that I'm heating the water, and as, as I'm heating it, the water molecule's kinetic energy is increasing, which causes them to go through a phase transition, producing steam, which makes the water boil. That's one possible explanation. Another possible explanation is, it's boiling because I'm making tea. Would you like some? <laughs> so those are two explanations of the same event. And the thing that makes a miracle a miracle is not that there is no possible scientific explanation for that event. The thing that makes it a miracle is that from the interpretation of the miracle receiver, whoever that is, whether or not there is a scientific explanation, it seems like because of the circumstances of events that God reached his hand in and said, well, I'm going to nudge things in this way. There may have been some natural mechanism for it. When Moses parted the Red Seas, there might have been an earthquake upstream that caused the water to stop flowing for a minute while the Israelites walked across. Fine scientific explanation, still pretty darn improbable. Uh, and so in that situation, if Moses says it's a miracle and some scientist up, up, upstream says, no, it was an earthquake, they can both be right. Um, so the idea that, oh, well, I think this is an explicable, it's a miracle, oh, no, I can come up with an explanation, therefore it's science, uh, this is a false dichotomy. They can both be true, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so let me, think, let me think, think on this to make sure that I give you a, a good answer. So am I discouraged from working on certain topics? Um, I would say no. Um, however, I, so, so no. I feel like I do have freedom to work on topics. But if I am working on a topic that is unpopular or that is, you know, outside of the norm, the burden on me of proof is all the greater. So if I'm working on something that people tend to generally agree with or is just a little bit off of what people already believe, then it usually requires less proof for me to convince somebody, yes, this is true. But if I'm going to work on something that's out in left field that other people are like, whoa, that's weird, then I'm really going to have to prove the daylights out of it before anybody's going to listen to me. Um, you know, so for example, I could work on UFOs. I could do, try to say, is there scientific evidence for UFOs? But I'm going to really have to work hard and provide some really, really, really solid proof of UFOs before anybody's going to listen to me. Um, and it doesn't mean that I couldn't do it. It just means that I'm, you know, I have to you know, work harder. One of, the, one of the dilemmas that I hear in your question, uh, too, is that when you said you're not doing much interpreting, 
are you saying that you don't feel the freedom to express any other views, or are you what, what's behind that phrase? Mm. Even though, um, for example, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, in a cell um, in the textbook, it says that mitochondria are the re a result of um, two uh, individual living organisms becoming one. And you can read about that, but you can also learn that not all the DNA is that form mitochondria is in the mitochondria. Which against that idea. So in a public high school, the information that leads that might lead a student to believe evolution is taught, but the whole truth isn't isn't revealed such that the student can think for him or herself and say, there's a problem with that theory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, not all the information only the information is given that leads to say evolution, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, all the Yeah, so I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not an education expert, so I, you know, I, I don't, I can't, I don't have, so I should, I'll make a comment, but I should also, I should pre preface it by saying that I don't have the same kind of authority in weighing in on this issue as I would on, you know, some other issues. Uh, you know, but it is my opinion that, you know, it, when the school sets a curriculum, and it may not be communicated this way in all school districts, but when the school sets a curriculum, the goal really should be saying, all right, these are the things that we want the students to learn. If the teacher wants to go in above and beyond and add something else, that's great. Now, I do want to say, I'll say that in a school system, I think you're doing your students a disservice if you don't teach them evolution. Because what you're doing is you're teaching them to fail their exams. You know, they're going to take exams in their life that are going to expect them to be able to answer questions about evolution. You need to teach them what the right answer to those questions are. You're not, you know, remember, I, told, I, mean, we just, I just gave the example of an ethics class where you, know, you, don't have to believe, you don't have to obey any of the ethical teachings. Just because they can give the right answer to a question about evolution doesn't mean they have to believe that it is true. It just means you have to be able to connect the dots and say, well, it would imply this, which implies this, which implies that. You know, it's sort of a rational reasoning, reasoning within a context. Um, and so within those, within those parameters that, you know, okay, look, if, even if you disagree with the curriculum, you want to serve your students well and teach them the principles of evolution, but you should also be, I think, be free to teach them, you know, additional things on top um, as long as, you know, they're able to get all the requirements in there. Do you want to say anything about, I mean, evolution tends to be put in soundbite terms, just as faith or creation tends to be put in soundbites. Do you want to say anything about the uh, sort of the scientific aspects of evolution when, when things get crossed, when lines get crossed between I would, I would prefer not to, because by stand, no, no, I'll say why, because by standing up here I have some kind of authority as a scientist and so forth, but I am not a biologist. Um, I'm not even a biological chemist, I'm a physical chemist, so I'm like, you know, you, it may seem like, oh, scientists, they're all kind of the same, but you know, like, ideal, like you know, intellectually, we're like over here, I'm, I'm here and the biologist is over here. And so if I make some comment, I fear that that comment will be interpreted as, see, a scientist said such and such. Uh, and I don't have that kind of authority and I don't want to claim it, so I'm going to pass. If one of you individually wants to come ask me afterwards what I think, I'm happy to, you know, elbow to elbow discussion, talk about it, but I don't want to uh, poison the discussion with that, so. Here's a great cynical question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at what stage in your career did you begin public talks like this one tonight, before or after tenure? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well before tenure. Um, so let's see, when was the first public talk that I gave? Um, um, I'd say it was, I mean, well, it, it took a few years before they, the, the, the students would trust me to, in, to invite me to give a public talk, but I never said no to any. So I think maybe in the fourth year I was at MIT, I got invited to give a public talk, and I said, sure. No, so. Yes? I'm just a little confused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so okay, so let me clarify what I mean by not being certain about the uh, interpretations of the Bible. Uh, I'm making a distinction here. There are times you can be certain and certainly wrong. Right? You can be sure of something, and then it turns out that you didn't have all the evidence, or something comes out, and you're wrong. My use of the word certainty is really just the statement that, you know, as human beings, the jury can't stay out forever. At some point, I have to come down on one side or the other and say, either I think this is true, or I think it's not. And I'm going to, you know, go with that. You know, because you, and usually this is an action decision, because most subjective truth require, at some point requests of me an action. Uh, so the... The sort of classic example would be, you know, you can ask me, do you think this parachute will keep you from falling at a terminal velocity? And I can say yes. But the test of whether I'm really certain of that is whether I'm willing to jump out of a plane wearing that parachute or not. Um, and so that's my test of certainty, is really that certainty, which by con conjunction means to me faith, is tested by action, uh, by, w by whether I'm willing to act on that point of certainty. So confidence is something where I'm, where I'm willing to say, sure, I believe that. Um, and certainty is the point at which I'm willing to sort of stake my action on it. Is that? Because you're certain about certain interpretations, you're confident about others. I would say that's yeah, accurate, yeah. Right. One of the questions uh, has something to do with um, how you observe people within the scientific community uh, and I guess I would put it this way, are you seeing, do you see uh, progress in the, uh, the dialogue being more healthy uh, in terms of the science and uh, faith dialogue, or, or do you still see a lot of uh, polarization? Hmm. I think it's ironic because I think I see both going on at the same time. Um, and I may, let me clarify what I mean by that. I mean, I, what I think, what I have noticed, you know, I, I, you guys can look at me. I haven't been around all that long. So I'm not sharing with you eons of wisdom here. But, you know, I have noticed over the last decade or so a definite move um, towards being able to discuss these issues in academic environments. Um, but I would say that, that that movement has not been driven by me or by you, but it's been driven by the students. So the students who come to college come with these belief systems. And they come thinking that these belief systems matter. And they come here to these secular, primarily secular universities. And the fact that they're like, oh my gosh, what do we do with these people? Uh, and the students are saying, look, you know, we have these systems. How does this impact this particular topic, this or that or the other thing? And so they want to discuss these things. And so then I think this forces us old farts to figure out and say, oh, well, OK, how would I think about this? And so I really feel like we have been challenged by sort of a generation shift in terms of the, the folks that are coming through university these days. On the flip side, uh, I think there has been no decrease in the amount of polarization amongst the sort of academic elite uh, of you know people throwing stones at one another. And I think the sort of classic example of this would be the new atheists uh, who are possibly more polemic than any group uh, in academia. Uh, and so, so I see both of these things going on. And my hope is that the students will win, because you, know, you guys are bringing things that you actually honestly believe in and think are valuable. Uh, so We have time for one more. While you're thinking of your one more, I'll, I'll just touch this question to uh, expand a little bit. Um, I think part of the John Pokinghorn, who is an example of a scientist, mm -hmm. person of faith, um, talks about how there are two different, obviously two different kinds of truth. And sometimes one of the other myths is that science traffics in rational truth, whereas faith or religion traffics in opinions mm -hmm. and, and blind ideas or hopes. And his point would obviously be that there's both both are pursuing truth. To what degree do we have to think of two different kinds of truth, or how, how does that jive? Right, so I should give credit where credit is due. Uh, that example that I gave about the boiling water and making tea, that was actually a John Polkinghorne quote. Um, so he, he, he gave that example as an example of two possible interpretations of the same phenomenon. Uh, and so then this leads to the idea of, you know, to what extent do we think of just sort of science and faith as just overlapping? descriptions of the same event, and to what extent do we think of them as making 
to so somewhat competing truth claims. And I, I think that to a large extent, we can think of them as overlapping truth claims. In other words, saying, look, this is the same event viewed from one side. I can see it in this scientific way. Viewed from the other side, I can see it with the eyes of faith. And I see it a different way. I think John Polkinghorne goes a little, one step too far when he, sort of, he more or less implies that this is always the way that it works. That somehow faith claims and, and scientific claims always just lay like this. There certainly are cases uh, that you can conceive of where they can conflict, uh, where some of the evidence that you see seems to point in the opposite direction. And there are plenty of examples of this in the Christian tradition where people are encouraged to hope in spite of the fact that they see nothing to hope for. Um, and so I think this would be a key example of where you're encouraged to have faith in something, even in spite of some evidence that maybe would make you lose hope. Um, and so I think the idea that they're just sort of these nice coexisting overlapping explanations is, is maybe a little bit oversimplified. Okay, well, let's uh, we'll let this be, be the, the last one then. It said, as a, as a Christian, you believe uh, in the Bible. Some, interp some, perturb some interpretations, um, let's see. The example you used was interesting, but there are also examples unexplainable. How do you think that Jesus changed water into wine? Hmm. Can't you accept that the Bible contains some, quote, errors? So how can I accept that Jesus changed water into wine? So, so maybe I will close, which will be a relative, I don't know how much time we have. I'll give you a relatively long answer to this that comes from sort of a personal anecdote, um, which has to do with how I actually became a Christian. Um, so uh, I, I was uh, in college, I was not uh, particularly Christian in the sense that I didn't go to church and didn't really care very much what God thought about that. Um, it's not, I wasn't, I was probably still a theist. I still sort of believed God was there, but I believed that he was kind of a very distant God and that he didn't seem to really care about what I was doing. Um, and this was partly judged in my scientific viewpoint by experimentation. I would try doing things I thought God would, angry, God would be angry about. Nothing happened. Therefore, God clearly didn't care. And... And, and with that, I mean, I was brought up in a Christian, Christian home, uh, and so I knew about all of these miracles in the Bible, but I thought, well, you know, they're probably just myths. You know, they're probably just, okay, well, Jesus probably didn't turn water into wine. They probably made a mistake, and there was an extra wine flask over there, and then they thought it was water, but it wasn't. And, you know, you can come up with all kinds of explanations for these things. Uh, and then when I was in graduate school, um, I was getting ready uh, to go to go into lab one day, uh, and I don't know how, any way to explain it other than to say that I feel that God spoke to me, uh, that I had a conversation with God. Now I had I told you about prayer and how this is a conversation with God, but you know, for those of us who pray, you know, we kind of use that term loosely when we say it's a conversation with God. You know, it's not like we're hearing this voice coming and talking back to us all the time. This was a time where I really felt like I was talking and there was a voice talking back to me. Uh, and for me, that was the critical turning point because it said that, look, if God can do that for me, now I don't expect that to have a huge impact on you because you're like, oh, well, you can come up with an explanation for that as well. But for me, that was a critical turning point because it said, look, if God can do that, you know, my distant theist God shouldn't be able to do that. He shouldn't be able to reach in and say something to me because he's gone for the next 10 billion years. But the fact that God could reach in to do that even just one time, even just once, suggests that why couldn't he do it again and again and again? And maybe, just maybe, all the things that they say that are all these miraculous things that happened in the Bible, maybe they actually did happen. And so when you say there are all these things in the Bible that, that, you know, that are quote-unquote errors, I don't think that. Um, I think, you know, uh, I think that those things did happen. So that's, that's my take on it. C.S. Lewis speaking on that particular miracle uh, made, I thought, the brilliant comment that uh, for water in the ground to go up through a vine and produce grapes that then turn into wine that is equally an, a miracle. That's, this is simply, you know, the miracle in John 2 was simply the door popped open uh, to see it more clearly. But uh, nonetheless, join me in thanking Troy for being with us.
really do appreciate the, the thoughtfulness and the time uh, that you took to be here. Uh, that's not insignificant. Um, those of you who are students here on the URI campus, uh, there will be uh, some opportunities. I think they're going to put those, they already put those up there. Yeah. Uh, just some informal discussion times. If, uh, if you want to take a card uh, that the ushers will have for you as you leave, just put your email down there. Someone can connect with you. And those are times available for some informal discussions if you'd like to pick this up further. Uh, so please take uh, the opportunity to fill out the, uh, the uh, forum evaluation. Make sure you do that, if you would, to help us for the coming years. This is our second Veritas Forum, and uh, we hope to make this an annual event. So thank you again for coming. Good night.